Hello, my name is Antonio Papano. I'm a patron of the Keyboard Charitable Trust. I was born in Britain. I've lived and studied in America. Now divide my time mostly as music director of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden here in London and the Santa Cecilia Orchestra and Chorus in Rome. Music has no borders and the Keyboard Trust neither. Over its long history, it has presented young concert pianists of 34 different nationalities, offering them performing opportunities internationally and now globally by means of these internet broadcasts. All are ready to grace the great concert halls. I now invite you to hear them in conversation and in concert. Please remember their names, then ask the Keyboard Trust to send them to perform where you are. Then you too will have helped to accomplish our true mission. Thank you very much. Hello ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's recital. I'm delighted to welcome to you to the new artist's recital for the Cuber Charitable Trust. Delighted to see the full house. We have a real treat today with Adam Heron, who has um, a rather colorful past, as we will discuss in our little chat after the concert. Um, and most importantly, he's got a rather fantastic program for us. I'm sure you're all curious about the music you're about to hear. Um, he is still very young, uh, but has um, Royal Academy degree and Masters in Music from Cambridge. Um, in his pocket already, he has played in 15 countries, won several competitions. He um, boasts the Harriet Cohen Bach Prize and overall a rather interesting individual. So I'm hoping you will enjoy this concert. And from me and from everyone in the Kibber Charitable Trust, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's not an easy world at the moment in many ways. And you being here today just shows how um, kind and generous you are um, in making this very important choice of supporting the future, supporting the young musicians who will be bringing solace to our hearts in the future. So thank you very much for being here today. And if I may just drop <laughs> a word about um, any kind of financial support that you might like to give us we are run on the shoestring, so if you are able to give us cash or uh, check or card payment of any kind, we would be <coughs> hugely grateful. Um, we've got newcomers. Um, so, and after the recital, we will have uh, a little informal chat where we can find out a little bit more about Adam himself, about his music, about his choices of programs, and um, other things, I'm sure. So, please. Um, welcome, Adam.
a wonderful performance. Yes, all wonderful, in one wonderful. Breath, all in one breath, such nobility and playfulness. And what a charismatic program. <laughs> I hope it was to everyone's taste. It's not exactly uh, you know, a standard program by no, any means. It wasn't, so it wasn't Bach, Mozart, of Chopin, and Prokofiev, no. <laughs> not the last one, no. no. <laughs> um, would, you like, would you like to stand or would you like to? As you like. Uh, I mean, probably. No, I'm grand. I'm grand. Very comfortable. Right. Can you hear us? Okay. Well, okay. It's, um, since the pandemic, it's become a bit of a new tradition for us to have a little bit of a chat with um, the performer because it just proved to be um, a really lovely way of getting to know the performer a little bit better because just hearing them play is, of course, wonderful and we get to know them in the most um, ultimate way heart to heart but also it's very nice to know a little bit about the background about their interests about their goals so um, we brought it into the real world <laughs> in the real concerts from our online realm so um, my usually the first question is about the program mm. um, <laughs> and given that it is well, quite a lot of these pieces is not something we would normally hear. I mean, Paul Williams, how often do you hear piano music by him? How often do you hear Thomas Sarney? He was a very um, prolific composer, but it was mostly entertainment music for opera, for um, pleasure gardens and water music and what have it. Um, so, you know, to even find keyboard music by him is a, is a, a great feat. Um, and... Um, your own compositions, of course. So how did you construct the Harmonic. I, I like the connection between these pieces at a harmonic and thematic level. I mean, some of the thematic um, similarities between all the works are quite... Thanks, Emily. Oh, yeah. That's the gin you got. Gin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are th thematic similarities, some of them very subtle, and I like the harmonic um, connection between the pieces as well. And I think, you know, it's one of those things that I think some people love and some people hate, but the notion of going through a program without interruption. I mean, I designed this to be a program that would be played from start to finish, from the Schumann to the Chopin, from start to finish. And so I do hope that that came across. But as for the program choice, yes, I mean, you make a very good point about Thomas Ahn being quite an underrepresented composer. And I think part of the reason is, you know, I remember that, that many of his operas do not survive simply because they were destroyed in a fire and the, the, partition, the scores were kept at Drury Day in theatre. It's very sad that, of course, there are some that um, do survive. Of course, the most famous piece is uh, the finale from Alfred, uh, Rule Britannia. But he was a prolific um, instrumentalist. There are numerous symphonies, there are keyboard concertos, keyboard sonatas, of which there are eight. This is the third that I played. And, you know, I, I believe Personally, a truly wonderful composer. Yeah. And symphonies too. <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating to hear stylistically because he lived at the same time as Bach, at least his early life was. Um, and yet, there are so many similarities to so many other composers. Scarlatti comes mm -hmm. to mind, Vivaldi comes oh, to yes. mind. Um, it's CP Every time Bach, I play it, I mean, <laughs> say Mozart Scarlet. even. Uh, so, so, many, so many different threads you can... You can well, that was written, that... Um, Compilation of sonatas was published in 1756, which yes. of course, as some will know, that's the year of Mozart's birth. And it's a funny thing, you know, after certain concerts I've played that sonata, and people come up at the end and they say to me, Oh, Adam Scarlatti was wonderful. <laughs> 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 and I say, Thank you. <laughs> it, it, you know, in a way, it's a compliment to Thomas Arne, because of course, Scarlatti, a, a canonical composer who is known and loved, one cannot say the same about Thomas Ahn. So it's a compliment to his work. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's hard sometimes to thread a direct line of how those connections happen. But we know that Scarlatti was published in London in the late yes, yes, 1730s. Yes. Very so popular, Thomas Ahn would definitely have known about that. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and vice versa, music has traveled in all sorts of ways, and of course, mainly through the scores and across, the, across Europe, so this, these connections are... Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a it's very good point. I mean, certainly, I mean, so for those who might know the piece, there is many chances, opportunities to play such techniques such as Note Inégale, French um, technique, you know, the harpsichord. 
um, uneven notes, literally. And of course, Thomas Hahn was, uh, he was inspired by that school. And so we get the French dance. Um, and so it's, you know, there is that connection. And I think, as, as we all know, music has always been a, a cross-border entity. So Thomas Hahn is no exception. And neither is Vaughan Williams, actually. He studied in Paris as well with Abed. So. Tell us more about your choice. Why did you find this particular composition? What drew you to it? The short answer is that it's the 150th anniversary of his birth this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think Vaughan Williams... He had quite a lot of an output for piano. And of course, the biggest, I think, of all of these works is the piano concerto, yeah. which has been recorded. Um, the pianist, including Ashley, also recorded that mm -hmm. concerto. I think, uh, and, and actually, some of you might recognise this piece because he arranged it later on for, as the Charterhouse Suite. Orchestra, yeah. for, exactly, the string orchestra. So actually, this, uh, this work, I think, within the context of string ensembles, is canonical. Mm -hmm. But it, in its original state from the 1920s as a piano suite, um, not so much. Mark Bebbington has recorded it, but I believe that's the only recording out there. It's a lovely work, and I think, you know, as always, Vaughan Williams is very eclectic. You know, it, it may appear on the surface as a kind of piece of uh, light nostalgia, but I think there is great sentiment, and much like in the Fifth Symphony, of course, that um, longing for old England. Um, so I, I, I do think it's, a, but funny enough, a very deep piece of music. Um, when played like that now, but hey ho. No. Well, that's the scene. Mm -hmm. that is exactly yeah. the reason why we're having these conversations, yeah. because yeah. one thing is to hear it, and quite another is to, to know a little bit more of the background. Yes. What yes. about your compositions? I'm really sorry, mm. my, totally my fault. I was so concerned about the money that I forgot to mention that Adam's <laughs> own composition <laughs> has four titles with four short pieces, and they are The Little Prelude, the pedalo and high heaven and meditation. So tell us a little bit more about ah, it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I'm sorry, oh, in that case, you must have been a, a bit in the dark about, you know, what's all this happened. Well, a little prelude, it's a bit self explanatory, really. I mean, for a, for a composer, that's you know, the opening movement of a suite is when they consolidate their ideas, thematic, harmonic, structural, all of that kind of uh, rigmarole. And then, well, I mean, pedal boats. Again, I've given these pieces titles that are quite. A, you know, tableau, right? They, they, they uh, give, a, give an image to the piece. And so, pedal boats, yeah, I've often had a, a good relationship with those things. You know, when I was a kid, <laughs> <laughs> the, first ever, the first time I came to this city, I remember going to Hyde Park, I was aged eight, and you know, those blue pedal boats. I thought they were very fun. <laughs> and so it sounded like that. It sounded a little bit like prolonged to me, or something like oh, that, well. very playful and fun. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Do you like Poulenc? <laughs> I think, you know, High Heaven or Paradis, it's a bit of a more uh, <laughs> open for interpretation. Mm. Um, okay. Something ethereal. I mean, I can't, I can't, it's not a programmatic set of works, but I wanted to show something ethereal, intimate with that work. And then the meditation was a rather good opportunity for me to explore my counterpoint skills. <laughs> but, because medita meditation, you know, everybody thinks it's synonymous with nocturne or something. Yeah. Really, uh, I think meditation is a process. And whenever I've tried to do it, it's exceedingly difficult, much like fugue writing. So I think that's a good form for it. But, but, uh, I, I must admit, I haven't played very many of my own compositions in public before, but I, I do think it's a very nice thing to do. It's always nice to reassess the you know, the concert experience, I think, after COVID, you know, whether it's innovating it a little bit more with some own compositions, improvisations and all of that. So. Well, yes, exactly. Well, That's why we really yes. liked that program when you first sent it to us. Uh. And that bridge from Schumann into your own composition, mm. is that mostly based on the harmony or...? Structurally as well, of course, there's the Floristan and Eusebius of Schumann, which so some people might know as being the antithesis of each other emotionally speaking. And at the end, one has that sense of calm, or one could say perhaps like a meditation at the end of the Schumann, where everything, time seems to stop, as it were, and the meter becomes all the more jum jumbled, I mean, one could say. And I think I've actually, that moment at the end of the Schumann is something that I find exceedingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, it's an extraordinary moment in the music. And I wanted to emanate that somewhat at the end of the little prelude, mm -hmm. where the meter and the time 
you know, are a little bit less pedantic and we can enjoy the sonorities of the instrument a little bit more than the, uh, the rhythm of it. So, I mean, these are very uh, subtle kind of similarities, but it's worth explaining. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should have these chats before the performance. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that gives the game away. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, people do ask me on occasion, you know, would I give a spiel you know, before a monologue, yeah. uh, before the performance? And I think in certain cases that's nice to do. Yeah. But as, as some of you may know, again, in, in Debussy's the Preludes, he only gives you the title at the end mm -hmm. of the Prelude. And so, in a way, it's, uh, it gives you the chance to think, oh, is this really a sunken cathedral? You know, is this the, part, the perfume mm -hmm. wafting in the air? So maybe it's nice to, I'm sorry, to keep you a little bit in the dark, <laughs> and then, we, uh, then I'll show you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what about the Chopin? Was it just the fact that it's a well-known work and you have to have at least one of those in the programme, or something else? Oh, I think that's a very valid point. I mean, <laughs> playing, uh, and, you know, playing all of this, uh, I say, strange music, as it were, is not, is not to everybody's taste. And I think it is certainly very pleasant for an audience to have something, you know, when, when the first note is struck, they think, oh, I know that. Mm -hmm. um, but also pianistically, of course, uh, for, for myself. It's important that we keep up to date and that we test ourselves with the standard repertoire. Because, you know, as pleasant as it is to play one's own compositions, I think the real test, of course, is whether you can tackle whether or not you can tackle the cornerstones of the repertoire. And yes, I, you know, there are so many canonical works that I adore playing, and this is certainly one of them. It's one of those pieces that I came to very late. I, I know a lot of people well, know good. this first. But it's, uh, no, I, again, you know, undoubtedly a great piece. And um, I think it was a fitting finish to the programme. Yes. 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 Well, that's, that's the thing. It's sometimes good to come to certain repertoire with certain amount of maturity and, um, and musical oh, understanding. Yeah. And you as a composer, of course, would be approaching yeah. from a completely different perspective. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes. I, I have done a little bit of composition myself on a very basic level, but I, f I remember that moment when I sat down to write something, a piano piece, and I was in a complete stumble block because I didn't know where to start. I don't know. Mm. You don't probably don't. Righteous block. Absolutely. Yeah, but yes. Where do you start? Which note of the scale? Which <laughs> key? Do you go up? Do you go down? Which which key signature? Uh, I'm sorry. Which time signature? Do you start with the crotchet or quaver? Or, uh, so many decisions to make. And of course, when you listen to something like Chopin, it's all there and so natural. And it's like thread absolutely work. perfect. Yeah. It, it's it's, exactly. it's and when you approach it from the perspective of a composer, you know. And, uh, <laughs> It's astonishing when you, when you mm. analyse the fact that that piece is essentially constructed on two notes. Yeah. Mm. That rising tone from the C to the D and that. It, it, you know, without kind of um, delving into a, a lecture on this. <laughs> you know. And of course this is my, my analysis of it. You know, it may be different from others, but it's extraordinary. Um, when people refer to these composers as being... It's the great canon canonical composers as being great. It's not simply that they were good at writing tunes. Mm. It's extraordinary mm. counterpoint, and uh, the structure is amazing. So, mm. yes. so when you're not thinking about all those structures and uh, harmonies and things, mm. what do you do to relax? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, playing the piano is a good one. I suppose. <laughs> but aside from that... Very simple, you know, I'm happy to... <laughs> I love just going for walks through London. When I used to live in London, I used to occasionally just walk around, you know, a district that I didn't, that I didn't know, taking the architecture, taking the sights, the smells, the... It's very simple in that way. I mean, there are many other things I like. Writing, uh, I like drawing, and learning languages was one of them. It's something that's taken me around the world. And mm -hmm. I think for a musician, there are people always ask, you know, what do you like to do aside from music? And, uh, you know, without sounding wrong, you know, a, a bit wrong with the it's, 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 uh, music is so eclectic in itself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very hard to, to, to explain just how eclectic and how you know, satisfactory <laughs> it is to sit down at the piano or study mm -hmm. or compose. So there are many things that I like, but I think it's very hard for me to relax outside of it. <laughs> 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 you know. Yeah. That's why we do it. I mean, I would say, people, I would say to people, you, you have to enjoy the process. At the end of the day, we spend 
the, the, the early stage of our careers, probably one hour or two on stage, but countless hours in the practice room. So I think it's very important that the process of learning and the process of studying becomes a hobby, becomes yeah. fun. So what if that's a that's wonderful what I answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting Thanks. to mm -hmm. us yes. and for your wonderful performance. May I please invite everybody to share a glass of wine and a nibble and make your own acquaintance with our wonderful artist and please another tiny little gentle plea to donate. Yes. Thank you all very much. <laughs>